All right, church, let's go to Daniel chapter 4. We're going to finish off this chapter this morning. And what a unique run through Daniel we've had. Um, this, is, this is fascinating stuff to me, and, and I, I've been um, really enjoying each week, and I, and I probably say that every week, but it kind of overwhelms me how the Lord works each week and just shows, uh, shows me different things, and, and I, I'm super excited to share um, this, this second half of the chapter with you guys this morning. So there's a unique name for God that's used six times in Daniel chapter 4. Um, a lot of times we see names of God throughout Scripture, and there's many different names for God, but there's a unique name that's used for him here. And we saw it twice last week in verses 2 and 17. And here this morning, we're going to see it again in verses 24, 25, 32, and 34. And the word is pronounced Elah. And what's interesting about this word is it's translated most high in the Old Testament. You'll see the word most high in, in your Bible whenever it's referring to God um, in this chapter. And what's interesting and why I want to make a fuss over this word to begin with, and I like to make a fuss over things, you know this, that's my personality. But the reason why I want to point this out is there's a number of words used for God in the Bible. Um, we know a lot of them. We've heard a lot of them referenced. But the reason why it's fascinating is that Allah is used here because it's drawing out an aspect of God's character. It's pointing out something about God, and when that word is used for God, it's in reference to what this person who's being, well, who's receiving an attitude adjustment needs to see, what they need to see about God that will set their minds straight. The very first usage of this word is in Genesis 14, and it's where Abram, who is yet to become Abraham, he's still just Abram, he's only halfway there, but Abram interacts with a king named Melchizedek. You guys recall the character Melchizedek in the Old Testament? He's referred to in Hebrews as well. Melchizedek is named as the priest to, the God, to God most high. The word is used there. And Abram in the same chapter refers to God most high as creator of heaven and earth. And in fact, there are several more references to God most high in that passage that's pointing out something about God's character. The phrase creator of heaven and earth explains the name used. It's not referring to God's role as redeemer. It's not talking about how he redeems people or to his wisdom. It relates to God's sovereignty. It's talking about his position and who he is. The most high God is the God who rules not only in heaven, but on earth as well. He's not just the God of the heavens that's separate from man. He rules over the affairs of men and the actions of men here on earth. And so we can understand what aspect of God's character Nebuchadnezzar is challenging when we see the word in chapter 4 used that many times for God, Elah, God most high. Something's being told Nebuchadnezzar, you're not all that in a bag of chips, right? You're not all that. You are not sovereign over all of your things. You are who you think you are. And so last week we read as Nebuchadnezzar told Daniel this dream that he had about the tree. Remember this beautiful tree that was massive and, and, and all this good stuff going for it. And the animals, you know, the birds were in the, the, the branches and the animals were, were underneath it. And it was providing for all these things. And then this watcher comes, also translated as an angel. And he says, cut it down, but leave its roots in the ground. And we'll talk about that more into the interpretation side of it today. But this dream is something that Nebuchadnezzar is like, I need to know what this, what's going on with this. And so he tells it to his wise men, and we've seen this happen in chapter 2 as well. They don't know what it is. They have no idea what's going on. And so he calls up Daniel. You know, no, they didn't have phones. But he calls up Daniel and says, come on in. I need you to show me what, what this dream is. So he tells him what it is, and then Daniel is going to react to that here in verse 19 of Daniel chapter 4. So we're going to pick up with Daniel having just heard this dream from Nebuchadnezzar, and now he's going to react to it. So Daniel chapter 4, verses 19 through 37 is what we're going to study today. Let's begin in verse 19. Excuse me. So Daniel says, whose name is Belshazzar was stunned for a moment, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king said, Belshazzar, don't let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belshazzar answered, my lord, may the dream apply to those who hate you and its interpretation to your enemies. That's never a good sign. Verse 20, the tree you saw, which grew large and strong, whose top reached to the sky and was visible to the whole earth and whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals lived and in its branches, the birds of the sky lived. That tree is you, your majesty. For you have become great and strong, your greatness has grown and even reaches the sky, and your dominion extends to the ends of the earth. Well, you, you have to imagine that Nebuchadnezzar at this point is like, why would I want that to apply to anyone but me? 
You know, like fantastic. But, you know, he saw something else happen. We'll talk about that in a minute. I mentioned last week that there was an indicators in this chapter that there's a close relationship between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. And I think that we see another one here in verse 19. We saw it before as you know, Nebuchadnezzar talks about Daniel. He comes separately from the other guys. He refers to him with, you know, this guy has the spirits of the gods in him. He has a special power and ability. And so I think that we see it again here in the king's reassurance and Daniel's alarm in verse 19. I think that Nebuchadnezzar's reassurance, like, don't let this trouble you, shows a relationship connection that when Daniel says, may this be upon your enemies and not you. I don't think that that was just formality. Because we don't see Daniel say things necessarily like that to the other kings. What he does say to them is, here's the truth. Let me unpack that for you. To Nebuchadnezzar, he says, I wish this wasn't about you. I wish this wasn't coming for you. What we set up last week, we see revealed here as well. The tree is Nebuchadnezzar. And it makes sense that Daniel's alarmed by the image of the dream because of what happens next in the dream. But I want you to notice something about Daniel. Being aware of the truth... And being aware of the truth about someone he cares about, did it stop him from speaking the truth when it was bad news? It didn't stop him from speaking the truth when the news was bad or if the news had been good. Daniel speaks the truth. Christian, are you listening? That's our job. We need to do it in love, especially you, Christian. But, you know, when we, when we, (laughs) it's often I say church because there's too many Christians in the church. Not, wait a minute. That came out wrong. No, but you guys understand what I mean. What's what's interesting, you guys, is how often we shy away from speaking truth because it's bad news for the person who's in sin, right? For the person who's going to have to deal with God. And so oftentimes, for believers, we're like, yeah, but God works all things together for good. Yes, that's true, but there's still rebuke. There's still conviction. There's still adjustments that need to happen to our lives. We'll talk about it in a minute. We're going to talk about God's discipline. You know, that's why so many people skipped out on first service this morning. They're having to prepare themselves to hear about discipline, you know. But here's the thing. We're not doing anyone a favor to not reveal the truth to them. You're not doing anyone a favor by just leaving it out, what God has spoken. We are called to speak the truth in love, but to speak the truth. And no matter how unpopular the truth may be, we're called by God to be those who speak truth regardless of or the situation, the setting, the culture, the society. I could keep going, but you get it. You get it. We need to speak truth. And Daniel spoke the truth, and he doesn't have to like it. He clearly doesn't like it. I wish this was about somebody else, but it's not. And so here's what's up. And he tells him what's going on. Church, never forget the opportunity must be given through us for the lost to repent unto God. The opportunity must be provided through us for others to repent unto God. Not to recognize that what I'm saying is true, for them to repent unto God. And please make that distinction very clear. It's not about being right. It's about leading people to repentance. That's why in Romans chapter 2, Paul says his kindness leads us to repentance because the goal is repentance. That doesn't mean we shy away from truth, but it gives us the heart behind it. I want people to turn to God. I don't want to just be right. I want people to see the Lord in this. So how we approach this matters. And we'll see Daniel reveal a a, a ministerial focus as he gets into the latter parts of this revelation as he interprets. Verse 23, the king, Daniel continues, saw a watcher a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump with its roots in the ground and with a band of iron and bronze around it in the tender grass of the field. Let it be drenched with dew from the sky and share food with the wild animals for seven periods of time. This is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree of the Most High that has been issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people to live with the wild animals. You will feed on grass like cattle and be drenched with dew from from the sky for seven periods of time until, notice this, you acknowledge that the Most High is ruler over human kingdoms and he gives them to anyone he wants. As for the command to leave the tree stump with its roots, your kingdom will be restored to you as soon as you acknowledge that heaven rules. You know, I just picture it gets, heaven rules! You know, it's like a rock show, but, that, but it's, in the, it's in the Bible. So, 
The watcher can be translated angel. This is the one that speaks the word. He has been given the directive from God, and he commands that the tree be cut down. And as we talked about last week, the stump is to remain with iron and bronze, symbolizing God's protection around him, and that God is still working beneath the surface. Do you guys remember that from last week? God works beneath the surface. Do not become disheartened when we see people that we consider to be hopeless. When he's talking about the stump, the status of Nebuchadnezzar being like a wild animal, and it's going to be for this certain amount of time. We know that seven, seven periods is going to be seven years of time that passes for him. He's going to live like a wild animal for seven years. And, and let me just throw this out there to consider. What is the moment during this entire period that you would have the least amount of hope for Nebuchadnezzar? Probably year six, 364, right? Right? You would have the least amount of hope for Nebuchadnezzar ever recovering from this seven years or six years plus all the way up until the very last day. In fact, I would suggest that your hope for him would probably be at its smallest point on the day he was closest to being redeemed back. Are you, are you catching my drift? When you reach the absolute end of what you think is possible, God is still working beneath the surface. Do not doubt the Lord. Do not doubt that he can still work, continue to pray, continue to reach out, continue to do what God has called you to do. I don't know how many periods of time is passing over our kids, our relatives, our friends, anyone that we're connected with that we know is not walking with the Lord and not right at this time. Don't lose heart. God is able to work beneath the surface. It may look like that tree is cut down and it's done for. But I read that passage to you from Job last week. Even though the tree is cut down, it's still alive. The roots are still in the ground. God's still doing things. And until that's gone, don't give up hope. Don't give up hope for people. God can still work. And we see this amazing picture, too, with this iron and bronze that's wrapped around it. Not only is God working beneath the surface, but he's going to protect him and not let him get harmed in that state that he's in. Did you notice who the decree came from in verse 24? Who did it come from? Do you see it in your Bible? The Most High, Allah. Yet again used. What's he communicating? Well, he says it in the text. Let's go back up there. Your majesty, this is the decree of the most high that's been issued against my lord, the king. You'll be driven away. And then he says most high again in verse 25. He says you're going to be in this state until you acknowledge second half of verse 25 that the most high is ruler over human kingdoms and he gives them to whoever he wants. Church, this has not changed. That has not changed. God is still sovereign. God is still in control, and things are not spinning out of control. And he's like, wow, I was on vacation for a while, and then the earth just quite exploded, right? He's not going to be shocked about what's going on because he's here. He's here, and God's timeline is still moving forward. Don't lose heart. The most high is still the most high. Nebuchadnezzar is not sovereign, he is not sovereign, and God is going to get that across to him one way or another. Don't you wish he would have just listened? Don't you wish that you would just listen? That I would just listen? When God's like, you're out of your league, kiddo. You're taking on too much. This isn't something that pertains to you or concerns you. Just trust me with this. Do we revere God as Elah, as the most high God? Do we revere him as sovereign over everything that's going on in our lives? Or are you a lot like me when something breaks, you're running around in circles trying to figure out how you're going to come up with a few pennies to fix it? Or we're trying to figure out how we're going to help our kid who's getting way out of control because, you know, my 12-year-old's going to be a 13-year-old tomorrow, and I just don't know what that means for the world. But when you think about this, you guys, we are going through these situations that we are given time and time and opportunity after opportunity to recognize that God is sovereign, and I don't want to turn into a cow. <laughs> I'm just letting that soak in. I don't want to turn into a cow. I don't want to be reduced down to this animal-like state. I don't want God to have to take drastic measures. I think about Jacob, who wouldn't listen to God, and so he wrestles God, and the Lord pops his hip out of his socket. You know what's funny is people are like, well, you know, he probably healed. No, you don't heal after that. Unless the Lord healed him, he walked with the limp, it says, afterwards. Do you know what that means? Hey, Jacob, you've run long enough. No running from God. What was Jacob going to try and do? Run. 
you know, all the young people are like run, dun, 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 dun. No, it's not like it's. <laughs> it, he's not allowed. He's not allowed to run anymore. He, all he can do is drag that leg, leg behind him. He's just going to limp the rest of his life. You guys, God is going to bring us to this state through His discipline if we are living in sin because He loves us. He loves Nebuchadnezzar. That's why He's going to do this. He loves us. That's why He disciplines us. Think about this. Personal discipline. What's the purpose? What's the purpose when God disciplines us? Because he just doesn't like us very much. God likes everyone else better than me. That's why they make more money and they're happier and they never have problems. First of all, stop looking at their Instagram. That's not real. Second of all, what is God trying to teach you? What is he trying to get your attention for? Hebrews chapter 12, it's a long section, but we need to look at this, and I'm not going to break it down because we don't have four hours this morning, but Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 13 says this, and ha you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you're reproved by him. Notice this, Hebrews 12, 6, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he punishes every son he receives. If he loves you, he disciplines you. What was the thing your kid used to always want to say when you discipline him? You don't love me. No, it's just really hard sometimes. But here's the thing. God loves us, and so he disciplines us. And verse 7 says, endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you're an illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had human fathers. Oh, the kids. There's not a lot of teens at first service. The second one, second service, are going to love this. We had human fathers discipline us, and we respected them. Do you? Shouldn't we submit even more to the Father of spirits and live? Shouldn't we submit even more to God? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them, but he does it for our benefit. Notice this. So we can share in his holiness. What does discipline beget? Holiness. What's the problem with our holiness so often is we're kicking against God's discipline. We're fighting against what he's trying to trying to teach us. No discipline, he continues in verse 11, seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been what? Trained by it. Are you letting the discipline of God, not only are you receiving it, but are you letting it train you for the next thing? Train you to be a righteous person. Therefore, strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed instead. Now you know why I was thinking about Jacob. You guys, God's discipline is so important for us. God's discipline is being shown to us in the life of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4 because this is a huge thing for us to learn. When we are in sin, God is faithful to discipline us. And when he goes to extreme measures, it's so that we recognize that our pride is out of line and we do exactly what Nebuchadnezzar does at the end of this. He praises God. He exalts the name of God. He's going to recognize, sorry, spoiler, he's going to recognize who God is. And we're given so much hope and motivation to learn from God's discipline, and so was the king. Now, he had to go through a really rough patch. I mean, we, we have a couple bad weeks, and we're like, what is up? You know, this is ridiculous. This is seven years. It says the kingdom will be restored However, as soon as he acknowledges that heaven rules, here we have the only time in the Old Testament where heaven is used as an idiom uh, for God, or use, euphemism, excuse me, a euphemism for God. Isn't that fascinating? This is the only time in the Old Testament where heaven is a euphemism for God. But that's, what it's, that's who it's referring to. So the king will be in an animal state, but still within the grasp of recognition and able to humble himself. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But why wait until punishment comes? Notice what Daniel says in verse 27. This is huge. Daniel doesn't want to see this happen. And so he encourages the king. And the king's going to be given a trial period to change his ways. Even though this dream has come and God already sees where it's going, he still gives us grace. He still gives us a chance. Verse 27, therefore, Daniel says, may my advice seem good to you, my king. Daniel's like, a word? 
just a quick word of advice, okay? Separate yourself from your sins by doing what is right and from your injustices by showing mercy to the needy. Perhaps there will be an extension of your prosperity. He goes, I don't know if it's going to work out, but you need to get some things straight in your life and maybe, maybe God will show mercy. You guys, he urges the king to take action in two ways. One, separate from sin by doing what is right. And two, separate from injustice by showing mercy to the needy. We give this little picture here of what was wrong with Nebuchadnezzar. Now, we know it's his pride. It's the sovereignty of God thing. But what reveals that we don't hold ourselves higher than the most high and that we don't hold ourselves higher than other people? It's when we separate ourselves from sin by recognizing that God is right. Okay, that's a humble attitude to take. So the first thing he's going to do is humble himself and separate himself from sin, not justify it, but he's going to admit that God knows what's right, God knows what's best, and then the second thing is to care for other people. It's to care for the needy. He had been unjust. He had been wrong. He had not shown mercy. Nebuchadnezzar was not able, and neither are you and I, to define for ourselves what right and wrong is. It's not for us to define what right and wrong is. It's up to God. He is the standard setter. And when we look to God and we recognize that he is the one that can decide that, we come humble to that place. You can't remain prideful and recognize that God knows better than you. That puts you underneath him. That gives you a position of humility. Now, the next step is to realize that you shouldn't be lording over on other people unfairly. You should be caring for others as well. Because when we get things right with God, things with man begin to align. When I get my heart right with God, and John talks about this in 1 John chapter 1, we recognize that when we have right fellowship with the Father, our vertical relationship, our horizontal relationships start correcting themselves. Why? Because if I'm right with the Lord and he's pouring his love into my heart, then I start loving people the way I should. You know, and I had a really fascinating conversation with someone yesterday about how frustrated they get with people in traffic and on the roads right now and how hard that is. Does it seem like everyone's a little bit more on edge? It's been a long year, right? We understand why, but how easy is it for you to get angry at someone in traffic? It's a lot easier for me than in most circumstances. But what's interesting is if I'm walking with the Lord in the way that I should, I start thinking more about what they've gone through that day. I start thinking more about maybe this has been even harder on them than I could have imagined. Maybe this person just lost a loved one. Maybe they never were loved as a kid. You know, maybe, maybe they were dropped on their head. I don't know what it is, but like, w are we thinking about the things they could have been through or are we just mad at them because they're upset with us and we're reciprocating rather than loving our enemies, we're hating our enemies and that's common in the culture of Jesus' time, which is why he said, I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who harm you. Easier said than done. But when we have a right relationship with God, it establishes a just and loving and gracious and merciful attitude towards those around us. If you find yourself lacking in mercy and grace towards others, you might have an issue between you and the Lord. And a lot of times we're like, I just got to fix this thing with this person. You're like, hold on a second. Spend some time with the Lord because you may not be capable. You may not be capable of that. God has established what right and wrong is, and when we submit to him, it's that path to humility and to being right with others as well. And so the king needs to be just. He needs to be merciful. And separation from sin will beget right doing, and justice and mercy will be the follow-up to those who are walking with the Lord and submitting to him. And this is what God speaks to us throughout Scripture. Are we merciful to those in need? Micah 6, 8, mankind, he has told each of you what is good and what it is the Lord requires of you. Oh, what is it? To act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. Act justly, love faithfulness, and walk humbly with your God. You could teach a 45-minute sermon on Micah 6, 8 alone. And that, those are the things that should define us. Those are the things that should be described when people look at us. They're just, they're faithful, and they walk humbly with God. Not to make us look good. Not so that we get the credit. So that people see God. So that people see the Lord's character. Well, verse 28, the sentence gets carried out. So all this happened, it says to King Nebuchadnezzar, verse 28, and here's how it rolls out. At the end of 12 months, 
as he was walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon, the king exclaimed, Is this not Babylon the great that I have built to be a royal residence for my, by my vast power and for my majestic glory? Yikes. Verse 31, while the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared that the kingdom has departed from you. You will be driven away from people to live with the wild animals. You'll feed on grass like cattle for seven periods of time until you acknowledge that the Most High, there it is again, church, is ruler over human kingdoms and he gives them to anyone he wants. At that moment, the message against Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people. He ate grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with dew from the sky until his hair grew like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Gnarly. You know, we were putting together some coloring sheets for the little kids this week, and I found some rad ones, and Ellie wouldn't let me use them. <laughs> She's like, Mike, these are terrifying. <laughs> I was like, but look at him. <laughs> he was like, it's horrible. And I'm not laughing to scorn him, but it's just brutal. Seven years. Just as the dream was interpreted, so it unfolds, but only because Nebuchadnezzar refused to humble himself. He was given how many months? Twelve. He was given a year to get this right. He was given a year to humble himself. Isn't God gracious? Isn't he merciful? He was so prideful before, he could have just carried this out, but he gives him like a layaway period. You know, you guys remember layaway? What in the world? Anyway, so, <laughs> but <laughs> that was just from my childhood. That just came rushing back. Anyway, but you guys, he gives him this, this trial period, like, okay, let's try out humility for another year, Nebuchadnezzar. You haven't been real good at it so far. And then what happens? He gets up on top. Of his palace, now he most likely, I read this in, in, in the, the annals of history, he most likely had three palaces. So he's at one of them, right? He's at one of his, I mean, you guys probably have that many palaces as well. And so he's at one of his palaces, and he's walking the top. Now notice it says, is this not Babylon the Great, verse 30, that I, now that I literally means I myself. It's very self-focused. The word is emphatic. I myself <laughs> have built to be a royal residence by my vast power and for my majestic glory. Essentially, he has just said that he is the most high. He has just claimed to be the most high. And God says, done. I'm done. That's it. What's something that you notice about prideful people? I don't know if you guys have noticed this, and I've seen this in myself, in, in my own pride. Do you ever notice that prideful people are incredibly not self-aware? They're incredibly not self-aware. You're like, yeah, but they're consumed with themselves. Interestingly enough, however, they will do and say things and not hear what they sound like. Not really think about it. When people are incredibly not self-aware of how they're coming off or how they're presenting themselves, it's interesting how Nebuchadnezzar is so sunken into his pride, he's so consumed by his pride, this, I don't even think this was difficult for him to say. I think he just fully believed it. He was so consumed with his own self-worship. And as his pride consumes him, and God's discipline then unfolds, it's important for us to remember, always remember, that everything in our lives we've received from God. He's up there claiming to have done all of this for himself. He's making a claim on everything he can see, touch, taste, that it's all him. It's all been done by him. It's all been worked out by him. And I can't help but think, as Paul scolded the Corinthians, Paul scolds the Corinthians in a proper way throughout First and Second Corinthians. But in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, he says this, For who makes you so superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? If, in fact, you did receive it, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? If you were given something, why are you acting like you made it? What is it that you possess that God himself has not made? What is it that, that you would like to claim responsibility or credit for that God hasn't gifted to you in the first place? Church, if we just sit and think about it in the most basic sense, there's nothing I can take credit for. I can't take credit for my kids. I can't take credit for my wife. 
I can't take credit for my, my ministry or calling or possessions. None of it. It's all been given by God. And the heart of Job is the right heart to have. The Lord's given, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What am I? I'm just a man. I'm just a human being that will die eventually. My soul was created eternal, and even that was created. Even that was made by God. How much of a part did you take or did you play? What kind of a role did you play in the formation of yourself inside of your mother's womb? You know, got to get this leg going, you know. Like, none of us did that. <laughs> Trust me, if I'd have been a craftsman, I'd be like, I could, I got to do something better with this. And God's like, no, that's all you need. That's all you need. It's enough trouble as it is. You guys... Are we actually recognizing in our day-to-day thoughts, in our our moment-by-moment thoughts, that God is the one who has given us everything we have, that we have nothing to boast about? Those abilities, gifts. Those possessions, gifts. Your kids, gifts. Yes, they're gifts. They're not curses. You know, parents, also gifts. But you guys, we can't, deny truth and allow ourselves to slip into the mindset of I've earned every bit of this. I am so worth it. (laughs) I can't stand pop culture. You know, look at me, I'm so worth it. No, no. You know what? Jesus loves these people. Jesus loves the people that drive you crazy. Jesus died on the cross for the people that drive you crazy. And the value that he has placed on them should cause us to love them. And to show them the truth. You're not all that. You're not the one that the world revolves around. In fact, the world is revolving and being held together right now around Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. We church are those that recognize that our abilities and deeds have earned us hell without Jesus. Your abilities, your skill set has earned you hell because of sin. You can't earn a thing outside of Jesus. Are we showing that to the world? You realize that you haven't earned anything for yourself, that Jesus is the only reason why you have value. Eternal punishment is what we were all due, right? We were all due eternal punishment, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace, amen? We are saved by grace. We're so used to hearing that, it doesn't even cause a stir out of us anymore. I mean, maybe a lot's going on in the inside of you guys that I don't know about. But everyone's like, yep, saved by grace. This is life-altering stuff. This changes everything. This just wiped the board clean and gave you a new life. It's almost as if we were a new creation, like it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Amen? All right, we're half awake. Here's the thing, you guys. This is so important that we understand because I don't want to be like Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, I don't want to be like him in whatever formation of God's discipline that would look like in my life, but I certainly don't want to graze in my backyard for seven years. My kids are not great about cleaning up the dog turds. (laughs) And I probably won't care. And I care right now. For Nebuchadnezzar, seven years he lives like a wild animal, possibly suffering from a God-induced mental illness. And we've actually recognized this in in modern medicine as bone therapy or something that's like it. Now, what's interesting, and the reason I'm talking, I'm I'm no medical guy, but I've done some research. A modern case of bone therapy resulted in a patient growing long matted hair and thick fingernails. Now, there's something fascinating about this mental disorder. It doesn't render the victim entirely unable to reason or understand. It doesn't render them unable to mentally reason or understand something. And it helps us a bit as we look at verse 34 to go, if he's that crazy, I mean, just like eagle feather claw man out there, yeah, there's our king. Hi, buddy. You know, like, I mean, it makes you wonder what the Babylonian people were thinking. And like I said, on day, on year six, day 364, they probably had as little hope for him as possible. And then the day ticked over. And Nebuchadnezzar, who still had his, his ability to reason and to understand, looked up to heaven. Verse 34, 
and notice this. We just had a change of writing here. He says, my sanity. We're back in first person again. We're back with Nebuchadnezzar speaking again. Did you notice it left for a little while? Now he's back. He says, my sanity returned to me. Then I praise the who? Most high. Who's he recognizing God as? Sovereign. And honored and glorified him who lives forever. Here he goes again, just as he gave us that opening statement at the beginning of the chapter. He does it again. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing. And he does what he wants with the army of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. There is no one who can block his hand or say to him, what have you done? At that time, my sanity returned to me and my majesty and splendor returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. Now, this isn't being said with that emphatic, yeah, check me out again. He's saying, this return to me is a blessing. He says, my advisors and my nobles sought me out. I was reestablished over my kingdom, and even more greatness came to me. Notice, you're like, whoa, Nebuchadnezzar, whoa, we've used language like this before. Notice what he says in verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and glorify the king of the heavens, because all his works are true, and his ways are just. Don't miss the last statement. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. The king switches into the narrative again. Verses 1 through 18 was Nebuchadnezzar. Verses 19 through 33 is, is this section where basically Daniel's writing and talking about what's going on. But here in verse 34, he comes back. He comes back and he recognizes, my sanity returned to me. My sanity is back. And did you catch the name he uses? We mentioned it, but Ilah, he says it again in verse 34. He recognizes God as the one who is sovereign over all things. And just as was foretold, when he acknowledged the truth, when he acknowledged the truth and gave honor to God, his sanity was restored along with his kingdom. Just as God said, but he goes, but first, you have to acknowledge this. You have to recognize. And we close here in this section, church, the book on Nebuchadnezzar. This is the last that we hear of him in the Bible. The book closes out on Nebuchadnezzar. We have prophecies and all these things, but that's it for his story, for his personal story. And what a journey that we get to walk with Nebuchadnezzar through. Most scholars agree that he would die two to three years afterwards. Um, there was a 10-year period that was given here, and you start figuring in the years that go, out, go on about his life, about when this happened, we triangulate it. You're talking about Nebuchadnezzar having a seven-year period of insanity, another year where he was actually given time to think about the interpretation of the dream, and then about two to three years at the end of his life, and then it's going to pass on. 25 years will elapse between Daniel 4 and Daniel 5. 25 years will happen in between then. And so a lot of people look and go, well, Belshazzar, handwriting on the wall. Next week, BJ's teaching. Woo! Don't worry, they'll be more excited then. But, like, it's, you guys, like, Daniel chapter 5, there's going to be a whole other scenario, but time elapses in between those, those happenings. A lot goes on in the Babylonian kingdom. There's a lot of trial, a lot of struggle. But here, as Nebuchadnezzar goes through this life-altering event about two to three years before he dies, isn't God gracious? Have you ever seen God restore someone really close to the end of their life? And isn't it an amazing testament to what God can do? And God did it for the king of Babylon. He can do it for people in our lives too. We've seen it. We end our journey with them here. But it's interesting. As we think of Nebuchadnezzar as the leader of a nation that dominated the known world at his time, as we think about what he was able to accomplish, as we think about his interactions with Daniel and the boys after the exiles. As often as he did what he pleased, he came to this understanding that he answered to a higher power. If you think about people in our, in our world that we may consider to be too far gone, not worth praying over, not worth spending a minute on, I think that the last person in the world we would have hope for if we were living in this time would be Nebuchadnezzar. I don't think we'd have any hope for him. But we should, because in fact, the final words of the mighty king of Babylon ought to echo in the hearts and the minds of the church. 
not only did God change his heart, what he says at the end of this chapter should echo in our hearts and minds forever. Praise, exalt, and glorify the king of the heavens because all of his works are true and his ways are just. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. At the end of his life, Nebuchadnezzar was writing like David. At the end of his life, Nebuchadnezzar was writing like Solomon in the Proverbs. That sounds like something. If I took that and just said, yeah, Psalm whatever, you'd be like, oh, cool. Isn't David inspiring? Now, Nebuchadnezzar was after the Lord got a hold of his heart, after he humbled himself before God. God can do this for even the worst of us. I would only add that God is not only able, but he does humble them. God is not only able to humble those who are in pride, who walk in pride, but he does humble them. And so, church, it's made clear throughout the New Testament that we ought to choose humility. There's an aspect of us. God provides the circumstances, but do you notice that Nebuchadnezzar had to acknowledge? God brought him down to an animal-like state, but he still had to acknowledge God. What does that teach us about humility? God provides the setting. We make the choice to humble and drop and say, you are the most high God. You are the king of kings. And so church, choose humility. Let us choose humility together now. All of us together, let's choose humility now. Let's serve each other. And, and I can't emphasize enough if you're like, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how better how I can actually humble myself. Like I know, I get the idea, but what are ways that I can actually do this? Read John 13 and then just keep reading the Gospels after that. Because Jesus gives us the best example of what it looks like for a human being who was worthy of all worship, honor, and praise to take the form of a servant, as it says in Philippians chapter 2, to humble himself into the, the, to become a human being and submit himself to the will of the Father and serve others and sacrifice himself even to be killed on a Roman cross. Jesus showed us the greatest example of what humility looks like and he deserved worship. If Jesus did that, I got to find a way to get to his feet. I got to find a way to fall to his feet. Amen? It's our calling. Lord, thank you for these lessons that we've been able to go through in Daniel 4. I thank you for Nebuchadnezzar, and I ask God that you would show us, Lord, how uh, we can take the advice of Daniel in verse 27, Lord, where he says, take some action now, man. <laughs> Lord, I pray that we would recognize that we need to submit to you and that you've given us time to do this. And, and right now, I don't know what's going on in our lives, what kind of discipline you've put us through just as sin has been our lives. But Lord, help us not to resist that, but to recognize that you discipline us for sin because you love us, because you care about us. You're not holding it against us. You're purifying us. You're sanctifying your church. And so Lord, make us so aware of what you're doing Lord, so that we can be used by you, so that we can be changed by you. God, we choose humility now, and, and, and I ask, Lord, that you would show us what it means to be humble. Jesus, the reason that John 13 comes to mind is because I can't imagine letting you wash my feet. And in the same way that Peter, Peter didn't get it, what was going on in that moment, but you told him, listen, you're clean, but I need to wash your feet because you're dirty. And Lord, we understand that when you told him that he was clean, that was salvation. But Lord, we walk around in a world and we are tempted by sin and we make mistakes. And so our feet are dirty. And so Lord, would you cleanse us again as your word says, Lord, that you're faithful and just to forgive us when we confess our sin. That you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, thank you for this church. Lead us on in humility. Lord, I pray that we would as a group, as a body, choose to be humble that we would recognize now before we're crawling around in the dust use us for your glory lord bless us as we worship